Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Rose. Welcome to today's webinar, Evaluating Income for Bank Statement Loans. Now, uh, we want this to be as fun and as engaging for you as possible. So as questions come up throughout the webinar, please go ahead and use that little questions uh, tool to submit your questions, and I will let the speakers know. We'll also have a, a extensive Q&A at the end as well, if you prefer. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, today's speakers. Uh, take it away, Joe. Hi, my name is Joe Lydon. I'm the co-founder and managing director here at Lensure. Um, been here at Lensure for, I don't know, since 2015. Um, prior to that, with accredited home lenders, I was the president and chief operating officer there, um, which was a very large uh, non-prime lender back in the day. Uh, welcome. And that picture there is probably a little dated at this stage in the game. I, I only wish that I looked quite like that. I don't look like that anymore. So that's the only picture I've got of me. <laughs> Kelly? Hey, I'm Kelly Strong. I've been with Lensure since 2015. Prior to that, I was with Accredited Home Lenders since 1997. And I started off my mortgage career at World Savings, which also dates me. I'm um, doing um, a paper loans. Steve? I'm Steve Arledge. I am responsible for underwriting and operations for a portion of the, of the company. I've been at uh, Lensure for three years and uh, prior to that, uh, some sometime in the past with accredited with Joe, I've been in the business for almost 40 years. Oh, I'm old. <laughs> okay with that. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about, principally about uh, bank statement lending, how we do it at Lensure. Um, we're gonna go through some real loan scenarios to give you a feel for how we uh, approach things. We do think that we're quite a bit different than others in this space. And that's why we're gonna go through some real scenarios of loans that we've done We'll go through some guidelines, uh, and then Rose will want to talk to you about some market resources. Um, you know, and we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this. Uh, we'd say jot your question down or send us a, a little, use the chat button saying uh, you got a question, and we'll answer all questions at the end of this. Okay? So take notes as you go through it. If you have a question, jot it down so that you can ask. Okay? Next one is about us. So we've been around since the Lenshore has been around since 2015. We're in San Diego. I've got centers in Rhode Island, Utah, um, and Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we've been securitizing the loans that we produce with a partner of ours, which is Ellington Financial, the hedge fund in New York. They own roughly 50% of the company. All of the people, uh, at Lensure's, in Lensure's management team have got a, we don't want to date ourselves, but we're heavily, deeply experienced in the non-QM arena. We do business in um, all of the important states is, except one, and that is New York. We only do non-owner occupied business there, but we've been in line for three years to get a license. And uh, when they decided to go, when they decide to go back to work from COVID, they're still in a COVID lockdown there in New York. When they decide to go back, maybe we'll get a license, okay? Um, so what do we do? So I, I answer this question because I talk to a lot of brokers and when people generally will ask me, so what, what, what do you guys do? And I usually start out with saying what I don't do. We don't do conforming, we don't do VA, we don't do FHA. And I like to say, though many of our borrowers um, are very familiar to all of you, if you guys do those types of business, our borrowers look like those borrowers in terms of their credit. Um, so most of the borrowers that we do business with have very good credit. And usually they're missing on the edges, I call it, missing on the edges. So it, usually it's an income issue, and hence the bank statements. Um, it could be an asset depletion type of loan that we do. Um, we have 
a different approach to calculating DTIs when it comes to looking at rental income and losses. So usually income's the big piece. Credit, excellent, income's an issue. A lot of deals come to us because of the property. Um, more unusual properties we consider, acreage we consider. Um, and then we of course have a, a menu of products that include DSCR, cash flow loans and on rental property. We do condo tells. Most of the A paper space doesn't touch on condo tells. We do second homes. We do um, non-warrantable condos. So all of the things that are on the edges where conforming FHA and VA does not do, we do. Um, as well as you can see, expanded properties, one to four units, five to eight units, I mentioned as well. So, um, and we got a good 10 flash 40 IO product. It's a fixed rate product. So it goes fixed to fixed for 40 years. First 10 is IO, second 30 is amortized. So a very, very good product to sell to your borrowers. That's what we do. Joe, Lee wants to know if we do mixed use properties. Actually, yes, and I'm going to be with my investor, my key investor, Ellington, next week because uh, we we have, as most of you know, the the market has, was kind of frozen up in the fourth quarter. A lot of companies in the space downshifted. A number of companies went out of business. We did not. Um, we're now kind of expanding our guidelines out again, and that is that is a product that I like. We're fairly conservative on it, but we do them. I approved two of them this morning. Um, so yes, we do a, we do mixed use, but we're particular about the properties themselves. So usually when a broker call broker talks to us about it, I just say send me the property, <laughs> and we'll go from there. Just send me a link to the property. I'll look at it and I'll give you a yes or no right away. And my <laughs> credit right. people do the same thing. <laughs> In today's economy, there are 57 million people that are considered to be self-employed or freelancers. The leading group is the millennials, but most of the majority of the workforce will be heading in the direction of being considered contract workers or freelancers in the next few years. Technology is actually leading the way, enabling more people to be considered self-employed um, because they can reach a larger presence being online and it's allowing them to get more clients and close more business, which is giving the economy um, one point trillion dollars annually for um, bid for their income, which then takes us to why we need bank statement loans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bank statement loans help these individuals qualify based on their income, their deposits, rather than what appears on their tax returns. They're non-traditional borrowers, business owners, self-employed, commission people, sales, the, the sales force always face challenges in documenting the income that they can supply. At Lencher, we have answers to those questions to help you overcome these obstacles and not use tax returns. So we can qualify borrowers based on their deposits and that helps with us closing more loans for you. Awesome. Joe, Steve, anything to add? Yeah, it leads you right into the next slide, really. Uh, uh, you see, we see a lot of gig workers, a lot of people doing Uber, a lot of people doing uh, tech jobs from their homes where they have very low expense ratios, uh, minimal overhead, maybe paying for their internet and uh, their computer systems and, and largely that's it. So what we do at Lensure, what we think separates us from the competition is we evaluate these uh, employment situations on a case by case basis. So we don't have some fixed expense ratio, that, expense rate that we uh, require. We don't say 50% of the deposits will give you for income. We say, what does the guy do? And in fact, we have a questionnaire that the guy can fill out. The borrower fills out a questionnaire, describes his business, what he does. If he's an engineer and he works from his home, we're going to go along with very low expenses and we'll probably end up at some 10% expense factor or thereabouts. If the guy's owning a restaurant, of course, that's a completely different situation where you have 
you know, a, a lot more costs that you have to build into that. So, so we have this SEQ that we have the borrower fill out to give us a good feel for the business that he's in, a good feel for his expenses. What is rent if he has rent, uh, whether or not he has rent, what his cost of goods may be, uh, depending on the type of business. Obviously, uh, you're doing construction. We know that your expenses are relatively high. You're probably going to be up at a 75, 80% expense factor. On the other hand, a guy that just paints probably would have a much lower expense factor. A person that's a contract employee that just happens to be paid on 1099 would have a very low expense ratio. And so what we do is we ask the borrower to complete a questionnaire, which gives us a means of finding the right fit on a loan for the guy, what he can afford based on what he's telling us his expenses are and what his bank statements are telling us his revenues are. Okay, and I'm getting a few questions about whether the the slide deck is going to be available. Yes, take you know, about an hour after the webinar ends, I'm going to be sending you an email that has the recording of, of this, and I'm going to include this slide deck that goes along with this. So don't worry about uh, taking too many notes because you'll have everything um, for you. Did you guys have any? Uh, go ahead, yeah, Joe. the only thing I'd add to that is this is you usually a back and forth process when our AEs are all supplied with the self-employed questionnaire that we ask the borrower to fill out. So we send it to the broker, the broker sends it to the borrower. Very often the broker does, a, or the borrower does a good job of completing it. Sometimes they do not, um, and in which case we have to kind of work through that. Um, but sometimes we'll get the bank statements, we'll break those down, and we use automation, so uh, yeah, that, that process can be done in 15 minutes but we do need the seq to have an opinion as well but, uh, this process is usually back and forth with the broker to get to a place where okay we got the answer um, and we can come up with an income number so it's, it's kind of back and forth with you okay great real world examples joe do you yeah. want to take this one yeah, so for example, you know, in the last slide, you, you saw that we look at a number of things. The, the main questions that are going to be on that self-employed questionnaire deal with, please, one, please tell us about your business. What, what is it you do for a living? Sometimes it's straightforward. Oh, I own a restaurant. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. Sometimes it's not straightforward. And we need, we need some understanding so that we can have an opinion about the bank statements. Um, then the next questions delve right into real costs. You know, do you have cost of goods sold? Meaning, are you having to buy materials, build a product, and then sell that product? Well, a restaurant, obviously, they're buying food, raw food, and they're preparing it and making it and then delivering it to you. So they have cost of goods sold. They also have employees, so they have labor. They also have a physical location, so they have a rent or or multiple rents if they have multiple um, restaurants. Um, and so we're, we're gonna ask those types of questions um, every time we look at a, at a loan. And so that's part of the SEQ process. And when we get to a restaurant, generally speaking, the, uh, the expense ratio is probably gonna be in the 65 to 75% range. Sometimes it can be a little less, um, for example, Sometimes our underwriter will look at the, uh, they'll go online and look at the website of the restaurant. And sometimes you can zero in through Google and look at the front door. And this has actually happened. So you, you go in and you look at the front door and the front door says cash only. Well, that's helpful to the underwriter because the underwriter is gonna say, oh, okay, so there's no ACH deposits. And that, that just answered that question. How comes there's no credit card? deposits coming in because most people pay with credit cards, but some restaurants use cash only. And so you can imagine that those folks that you that are using cash only are probably not taking all of that cash to the bank and putting it in the bank. They probably never go to the ATM machine like you and I do. Um, and so in those cases, we're um, are willing to use a, a little more liberal of an approach to the expense ratio. So that's that's just one example. The, the fact that we're not a one size fits all on the expense ratio is unique to us, um, we think, and it's an important one. We, we do not think all businesses have the same 
cost structure. We think that's a ridiculous um, place to be. We think it's all over the place. So to what Steve was saying earlier, our expense ratios range anywhere from, we call it low side 10 to as high as 90, 95, 98. Yeah, I had, a, I had a restaurant owner application just the other day, and the guy was part of a food court. So actually, he had moved from a food truck to a food court. And so he was part of like seven or eight restaurants inside of one common area. Well, all the credit card payments were paid through a central process. And then he got a check from the guy that actually owns the food court itself, that, the, that main entity. He got a check. And when his when they paid his check, they backed out a certain per, uh, percentage of the receipts for rent, actually their cost, what they they took their piece. So on that uh, expense ratio, we were down at 50% of the restaurant, which is you know unusual, but it, it made sense because we were able to establish, hey, his rent's already coming out of what he, what he is going into his account. It, it's common sense lending. We can also oh, go ahead, Kelly. On this particular scenario, the restaurant owner, I had a file that Joe approved. They had five locations. So we were able to qualify the borrower based on all five locations bank statements. So we don't limit how many accounts we can use to qualify. Neelu wants to know if we'll accept a CP, CPA letter for the expense ratio. Um, no, we prefer to use the SEQ. We'll consider a CPA letter. We don't ask for a CPA letter when we actually think that's a competitive advantage for not asking for it because generally speaking, the CPAs are gonna go right to last year's tax returns and calculate what it was last year. Um, and so as we all know, people pad their expenses for, so that they pay less taxes. And so a CPA is not going to get aggressive um, with that. So we'll, we'll consider it, but I would say we likely probably get a little more conserve, more aggressive than a typical, what we would see typically from a CPA. And we're kind of saying, well, okay, what is, what is this SEQ? Uh, we have to believe, you know, what, what it is we're looking at. And so it's got, got to make sense. And that's why I say it's kind of a back and forth with you and the borrower. Um, so we will use the CPA, but we don't require it. So I, I, want, to, I want to underline that. We do not require CPA, um, CPA letters to reconcile expense factors, expense ratios on bank statement loans. Okay. okay. Alexandra wants to know if we originate a lot of bank statement loans from realtors. Oh my gosh, loads of them. I want to say 55 to 60% of the loans that we do are purchase money. Mm -hmm. and um, 55 to 60 percent of the loans in total that we do are bank statement loans. So we, we, we don't do a lot of the full doc loans that we do. Obviously, well, the first question is, is, well, let me start with if my average FICO is 740 and it is, then why aren't they going conforming? Well, it's because I said there's something on the edge of that deal that's drawing it to us very often bank statements um, or property. Um, so, you know, uh, that, that would have to answer. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Alexandra is a follow-up to the CPA comments that, no, I'm sorry, uh, Nilu says, it's, it is a, com a competitive advantage not asking for a CPA letter. Uh, he comments, it also saves time and cost. Yes, it does. Okay. The doctor. Well, there's you know a couple of different kinds of doctors. A guy that owns a doctor's office, uh, where you know he might have uh, multiple bank accounts. He might well have one bank account for processing his uh, you know Medicare or insurance payments coming in, and then another for private payment uh, you know fees for customers that are paying privately. But you also have a, a fair amount of doctors right now. In fact, we see it all the time that are now 1099 contract workers. So you might have a guy that was a doctor under a W-2 scenario for the last four years. And six months ago, he went 1099. Well, we have the flexibility to say, okay, we get he's self-employed now, but is he really? I mean, he's, he's working for a company. They're just paying him as a contract employee. 
So if you can show me, you know, for the last six months, he's making as much or more than he was making when he was making the W-2 income, we'll, we'll knock that deal out and call it full dot because that's what it is. The guy's an employee. He's getting a regular monthly amount that is equivalent or greater than what he was making under the W-2. And we recognize fully that if he wanted to, he could go back and work another W-2 gig. He's already got a job. He's doing this for a reason because it's giving him more money and we'll get that loan done. Uh, you don't have that flexibility on uh, on an agency loan. And, and I'll give you an example, uh, I, a loan I just approved yesterday. He was a dentist. He had a history of being a dentist. He owned a dentist office in Colorado, Brian. He had moved to Utah. He started a new practice in October of 21. Well, so obviously you're not gonna have 21 tax returns. That's not helpful. We have 2020 tax returns showing the guy made good money. I got his last 12 months bank statements but he doesn't qualify off of his last 12 months bank statements. Why do you suppose that is? Because for the first six months, he didn't have customers, right? He was just building up that business. But for the last six months, the guy's nailing it. You can see the increase in his deposits. You can see the, the business is starting to thrive. We used the last six months average for qualifying and we got the deal done. 80% purchase, I think it was a million dollar purchase price. And that gives you an example of how we can be flexible and how we can get that 740 FICO to a doctor, somebody with obviously earning potential without worrying about the fact that he's only been a 10 million employee for six months. Yeah, and if I add, I'm familiar with that loan because I was part, part of the decision making. You approved it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> adding to the complexity of that loan was um, usually a doctor transitioning like that they won't go to zero and start from scratch. What they'll do is continue to work for other medical offices. And so on that one, we actually used some W-2 slash pay stub income because the guy was working for two other doctors on a, like on a Tuesday and a Wednesday so that he could supplement his income to ultimately transition away from the W-2 income and he's got a full on practice going. So I think that that's an important point to kind of understand is, is like, when when I say it's a lot of back and forth with the broker slash borrower, we, we're certainly willing to listen to the story and consider it because we are make sense lenders. And in the example that Steve has given you, that's that's put on display there. We're definitely, you know, that sounds aggressive, but when you start piecing it together, you get to a place where, oh, okay, that makes sense. And then we go uh, from there. So, um, and then the other thing to understand is, there's a lot of our competitors who won't allow, allow for multiple bank statements and we'll get into a transaction and I'll say, look, based on what you have here and based on what they said in their SEQ, the guy makes no money. However, if you look at his credit, his credit is perfect. The guy's got a 780 FICO. So his credit says that he makes enough money to pay all of his debt and pay it well. So logically, it doesn't make sense that he doesn't make any money. But he told us his expense ratio is X, that came from the SEQ. And the bank statements, if we're using his expense ratio, all of those revenues are going to cover his expenses. So I'm telling you, Mr. AE or Mrs. AE, that you don't have the full story here. I promise you, the guy has other bank statements. Boom, go back and ask the broker. Broker goes back and asks, ah, yeah, here, here's another set of bank statements. Boom, then now we're looking at a second set of bank statements. And then we have a more textured conversation around the topic. And then the guy will usually tell us what he does. Well, I, I pay all of my expenses out of this bank account. So you'll see these, tra these trans, uh, transfers coming from another account and all my revenues come into this. But you'll see it all over the place. No one does the same thing. Some some companies, some doctors, in fact, will set up one account for all of their Medicare, another account for all insurance company activity, and a third account for all, um, you know, cash and checks uh, paid. They, that's how they keep track of the three different groups of revenue. So the, the, the learning point here is that we look at those things, we consider them, do they make sense? We can we probe for more when we think it makes sense. And so know that when you're working with us, that's what we're gonna be doing. We're asking questions, not to make it more difficult. We're asking questions to get a loan closed. Because that's what you're trying to do, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, another quick example. I, I, I've seen it where they have a business account. There's some sort of a retail shop. They have a business account. You can see the money coming in. But 
that what they sell online, they might get through another account on it. They, I've seen them use their personal account for the PayPal, PayPal stuff, payments that they, that they get for on, online sales. So we can use both of those. We'll just isolate the PayPal uh, deposits into his personal account. We'll use the regular deposits from his business account and we can blend them. So we have flexibility. Fantastic. Joe, I remember you telling me about this scenario. Yeah, so this is a, a, an actual loan that we did. Um, I was involved with it because it was a new AE who I was helping train. And, and we had a borrower who had excellent credit and they owned seven different properties, all free and clear. And uh, the principal income came from these properties. And so when you saw their bank statements, so the broker sent us the bank statements and said they own these properties. And we can see because this guy actually, there was a different header for the address of each property. So, I mean, the guy really was helpful because when we laid out the bank statements on a spreadsheet, we could see, oh, here's one column for the uh, 204 Johnson Street, and here's another column for the 123 Anywhere Street. So that was easy, um, but it wasn't enough to qualify for the loan. So you look at the 1003 and the 1003 says, Hey, my wife is an artist and I'm a musician. We only make like a thousand bucks a month, but it's it's enough to get us over the hurdle, the DTI hurdle. So we went back to the uh, broker and, and the broker said that those are the bank statements I got. And, and the reason I got involved because this young AE was being pushed by the broker. Um, and on the third time being pushed, she came into me and she said, uh, you know, can you help me out here? Because uh, this broker is saying that there is no other bank statements. And so I said, sure, let's get on the phone. So I called the broker and I, you know, in a very nice way said, right now we're at a no. I think that if I talked with your borrowers, we'd get to a yes. So I think there are other bank statements. And so I said, I'm not going to talk to your borrower without your permission. And, and I walked him through what we did have. And he said, okay, well, let me get on the phone with the borrower. I'll tell him that you're going to call him and then I'll give you a green light. You call him. I call the borrower. Borrower says, and I walk him through what he gave us. And I said, but on your 1003, you said you're a musician and your wife's an artist. Where is that income? And the broker said, oh, well, that's on another bank statement. Of course, I knew that because this guy was so organized with his first bank statement. And then he gave us the next set of bank statements and boom, there's that revenue. Of course, we are able to close the loan. So you have a lot of that. And that's why I underlined there's a back and forth that goes on here. We're trying to get to a yes. We are yes people. We want to make loans. We don't make a nickel. We're just like you. You as a loan officer, you make zero until you close the loan. Same thing with us. We don't make a nickel until we close a loan. So we are really in the business to close loans. We want to close loans. So we, the kinds of loans that we do though, they're very unlike conventional loans. They need a little bit of work, but nothing that's insurmountable. It really is just a effective communication by and between us and you. And we work together to get it across the line. Okay, great. Steve, why don't you take us through the um, underwriting report? What the underwriters look for in bank statements, obviously we're looking at the deposits to determine the revenue and hopefully they're somewhat consistent depending on the type of business it is. We're going to look for large deposits, large withdrawals. Again, if, you, if you've got a guy that uh, owns a retail store and you see, you know, reasonably mid-sized deposits all along and there's some $200,000 even deposit, we're going to question what is this because you know probably nothing in his store sells for two hundred thousand dollars it may be a loan that's what we're going to ask we'll look for payments going up obviously payments of salaries if your seq says he has no uh, no employees and no wages but there are wages coming out of his bank account of course they'll, they'll question that but uh we're looking for trends hopefully it's trending upward like the the doctor loan i discussed uh, with any luck that would be ideal but a good consistent amount of deposits that's how we measure the revenue we're going to the seq to see what he says his expenses are kind of measuring those we don't actually go in and calculate 
every dollar that he writes out. We just look and see, does it kind of jive with what they're telling us on the salaries? And, and that's how we move forward. So, uh, you know, the bank statement name should match the company name or the borrower's name, things like that. But pretty much like you would probably look at the bank statements. We're looking for, you know, hopefully the guy has money left over. It, he deposits more than he withdraws. Or if that's not the case, we can see that he's putting money over into his, his savings account from the account or paying himself a salary. But, you know, common sense stuff. Not a whole bunch of NSFs in there. We can live with a, a few NSFs. People bounce checks to businesses. We get that. But, uh, you know, you don't want it to be too beat up. Steve, uh, Robert wants to know if we if we initially need all the pages of the bank statement or just pages with deposits. No, we, we need all the all the pages of the, of the bank statements. Yeah, that's a stickler, isn't it, for underwriters? They don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, we don't they, know what's on that page you're not giving us. <laughs> if it We're says, a little echo that way. If the last page at the bottom says 28 of 30, you can bet the underwriter is going to step and say, we need pages 29 and 30. So yes, it's what, what aren't you, what are you not showing us? So as I said to you earlier, we're really trying to make loans. Um, in fact, I would say to you, there's a, you know, we have a 24 month bank statement program and a 12 month bank statement program. And I can't tell you the number of times people come in with 12 months. And of course I look at that and I say, well, why, why, why? The guy's been in business for seven years. Why are we looking at 12 months? Because it's a little better price if you go with 24. So I'm wondering, well, why are you going with 12? And then what will happen after I'm like clawing through those questions, like, let's talk. Um, finally, they come to me and say, well, the guy was affected by COVID. And we don't want to use that here. I said, well, I'm okay with that. Show me 24. And you're going to get the pricing of the 24. I'll feel better about the deal looking at 24. And I'm just going to be looking at the last 12 months trends. In fact, sometimes I'll I'll cut a year and go with the last three months trend if we're close. So let's say 12 doesn't get us to 50 DTI, but the last six does. I might say, look, I like the trends. I like the story, like the credit, like the LTV. Boom, let's go with it. So we really do want to try to make loans. And we have the ability to do that because our loans perform quite well. We know how to pick winners. Um, and we never, ever, ever, ever look at just income. We look at always the big picture, income, equity, credit, and assets. Look at all of those things together and we make decisions. Um, so. Okay. Sergio wants to comment. Sorry if I missed this before. How many months of bank statements? 12 and 24 of the program. Oh, I was going to say that takes me to my slide, which we have two bank statement programs, 12 and 24 months. Um, borrower doesn't have to be 100% owner of the business. We will take the percentage of the business that they own and calculate the income based on his percentage. What we do differently than some other lenders is we vet all the income prior to underwriting. We have an extensive prequal um, stage that we get the 1003, the credit report, and all the income documentation, the bank statements with the SEQ. So our underwriters can vet the income up front and you know whether or not you have a valid loan moving into underwriting. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, SEQ stands for Self-Employment Questionnaire. Correct. That's the, that's the form that we give the, uh, the borrower fills out that tells them um, about our business, about their business. Okay. Thanks. Expense ratio. Yeah, Steve, is, you want to take us through this one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, this is what we do, what we use the SEQ for, and we analyze the bank statements for. After we get all the information, you tell us what his expenses are. We add up what his deposits are. We calculate an expense ratio, so that's how we determine what we use for income. So if the guy has ten thousand dollars in monthly deposits, he writes down twenty five hundred dollars worth of expenses. You'd have a uh, set a uh, 25% expense ratio and you'd have $7,500 in income. I mean, obviously those numbers vary dramatically depending on the type of business, but that's just how we calculate his income, his, the income we're going to use for qualifying based on his bank statements and the SEQ we provide. Okay. 
Roseanne says, uh, I had a contractor who had lots of smaller deposits for handyman type work, but every couple of months there were larger deposits for rem remodeling projects. Even with the bids and invoices, we had to exclude those. You guys have any comments on that? Yeah, sure, I'll take that one. So a couple of things there. If in fact he said to us, yeah, I do mostly handyman work, but I also rehab kitchens every now and then, I'd say, okay, fine, we're, we're gonna give you one expense ratio for the handyman work, and we're gonna give you another expense ratio for the, the rehab work. Um, and so, you know, we might say, your handyman work, we're gonna give you a 20 or 25% expense ratio, and for your rehab work, we'll give you a 65% ratio. Really, we would ask, can you give us an SEQ that describes your, your rehab work? Because I break contractors into three different groups, and I've worked extensively with contractors because I've flipped 500 homes myself. So I know about that. So hasn't Kelly. So there are some contractors who are true general contractors. They have never picked up a hammer in their life. They are managers, and they hire um, subcontractors. And th those contractors are, are going to look for anywhere from a 10 to 25% markup on whatever the subs are charging net. Okay, and so therefore, on that guy, we're probably using a 75% expense ratio, okay? The next, on the other end of that, if you're thinking about bookends, on the other end is the guy that's got a truck and he puts fences in your backyard. So your neighbor just put up a new fence and you say, wow, you, you did a good job of that fence. I'm gonna hire the same guy. And you knock on his, you walk over to him and you say, hey, I'd like you to put up a fence in my backyard. Would you do that? He says, sure, but I don't have a nickel in my pocket. I, I do not have cash. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go to Home Depot, I'm gonna select the materials, I'm gonna call you, you're gonna pay for the materials, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna install your fence. And I'll just charge you a fee for the fence. If you knew that was the guy, you know he's not at 75% expense ratio, he's not even buying any materials, it's likely he does not have um, much labor. That guy sometimes has a sidekick that he pays two, $300 a day. And so you'd factor that in. So that guy might be 20, 25% expense ratio. And then there's those in the middle who are, you know, a, a trained carpenter who has come to know uh, a little bit about electricity, a little bit about plumbing. And they, he, he or she has one or two full-time employees that they go do kitchens and they do bathrooms and they're pretty good at it. But they are labor as well. And so on that one, we'll probably give a 50% expense ratio. So the important thing is, is that we dig into them, we ask those questions, and when we come up with the answers. So, so on your example, the question that you asked, like, will you consider it? I would say two expense ratios, and then sometimes what we see, this is very uh, common, with realtors, we see a lot, you, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of realtors. You could have a realtor who re sells real estate, real estate salesperson. You could have a real estate broker who oversees real estate sales people. You could have uh, a flipper who's in the real estate business, but also does flipping. You could have a property manager. All of those people are in the real estate business. And so you have to kind of know what it is they do and principally. And very often we do see Real, real estate people, realtors, and some contractors doing flipping. And so flipping, when you just look at the deposit, you say, well, I'm not gonna kick that out. I'm gonna know what it is. So if I see a deposit that's coming into, coming in from a wire to the bank statement from a title company, I know what happened. They sold the property. And those that's the sale proceeds coming from the sale of that property. So I'm gonna ask, okay, show me the uh, estimated closing final, final closing statement of that property. And I can see if they had fix and flip financing on that, okay? And I can see what the proceeds were. So if they had financing on the property, then the proceeds are probably um, not all profit because they had they were footing the bill to run, to build the place and put it together, the rehab. Um, but they didn't have any financing. When I was flipping properties myself, we were buying the properties with cash. So that wouldn't be the same case. When we would sell properties, properties were always free and clear because we had bought them with cash. And then we used our own funds to do the flips. Actually, they were from Wall Street, but it never showed up on a final estimated closing statement. Point is, when we understand what's going on, 
we can apply all of that, you, you might call it creativity, we just think we're applying make sense decision making to the process. Great. Jonathan is both a, a real estate and a loan license, a lending license. One challenge that I have is to generate pre-approval letters for my clients who want to qualify from their bank statement loan on bank statement loans. My understanding is that the type of um, that your type of lender does not offer pre-qual letter for non-QM loans. Do you have any solution to this problem, Shelley? I that goes back to how we pre-vet the file up front. I would ask my broker to send in the 1003, the credit report, and the bank statements. I would send it to my underwriter. She would do a pre-qual based on looking at all the documents supplied, figuring out the income with the expense ratio. Once I give you the pre-qual, at that point, you can issue the pre-qual letter because we will stick by our pre-quals and close the loan because we vet everything up front. Okay, I'm getting a lot of questions on specific like underwriting and LTVs and loan amounts. We're gonna get into that, all of that in just a little bit. So if you guys could be patient with me. So this is what sets us Lensure aside from the other lender. We don't require that P&L that other lenders require. We don't have a set expense ratio. We can go as low as 10% depending upon what they do and as high, like we talked about on restaurants, as high as 90%. It's, that's why that SEQ and how complete it is is very important to us. We go up to 90% on business bank statements, but we have a 740 FICO that's required to go up to 90%. We also go down as low as 640 for bank statements. We require 24 months, but only a 70% LTV. The borrower does not have to be 100% owner. And we basically underwrite the bank statements up front so you know before underwriting that it is going to work. We also will allow NSFs and overdrafts, we're flexible, but we are going to ask for a letter of explanation to understand why they have the NSFs. Okay. We have a variety of programs that we can offer. Um, our bank statement program is our best product, but we also allow foreign national loans. We have cash out up to a million dollars with an exception greater. Um, we have a non-warrantable condo and condo hotel programs. We do units with the DSDR and second homes. We have a fix and flip, which is new, but it is becoming a popular product of ours. Acid depletion, bridge loans, and we offer um, interest only and 1031 exchanges. I'm gonna add to that. Okay, so foreign national loans, most people in the space, I think we're the only ones that do the following. Most people in the space want their foreign national loans to be DSCR loans, meaning they've got to be investment properties and they have to DSCR greater than one. We also do second home foreign nationals where the DSCR isn't a requirement. Cash out loans, I've, I've done plenty of $2 million cash out transactions on high-end properties in Florida and California. So cash out is the, the limits are certainly a, a squishy number. We don't put too much into that. Condo hotels, we're probably one of the few people that do condo hotels. I would say to you, generally speaking, we like to stay above 600 square feet. We do want a full kitchen um, in place um, on those condo hotels. Uh, Second homes, construction takeouts, fix and flip, fit, flip, bridge loans. That's the most, probably one of the best products that we have. It's a one payment only product, which means it's generally for financing a person's equity to have in their departure property. Let me give you an example. Um, departure property is worth a million bucks. Person has 250 first on it, and they want to access another 500,000 in that equity. They want to be able to go and buy another house without putting an offer that says 
contingent on the sale of my property. So I'm going to give him a cash out bridge loan on the departure property for $750, $250 to pay off the first, $500 to put in his pocket. He will have no payments on that loan for one year. Okay. Then we finance that, that proceeds, the cash out goes to serve as the down payment. Sometimes borrowers add to that down payment with their own cash and then they buy a more expensive property or in a lot of cases they buy down. This is used by elderly folks that are buying down where there a lot of their equities in their uh, home and they can't transition e uh, easily. So this is a great product. We, we're the only ones in the space with this product um, with the way it's structured. Other people have bridge loans, but they don't, don't have one payment, one year only bridge loans. So great product. Ask depletion and qualifier, you know, depletions divide by divide assets by 120, qualifiers divide assets by 60. Um, interest only, I mean, it's just a great product. In 10 slash 40, it's, it's fixed at IO for 10 and then fixed for 30 years thereafter. So it's a great product. I wanted to add that the asset depletion can be used in combination with this job. So you've got a guy out there that has a decent job, but he's just over 50%. So you can't get it to qualify conventionally. He, he's got, you know, 745 quotes, an easy deal, but he's got $700,000. Well, it doesn't have to be in a retirement account. It just has to be $700,000. So we got $700,000 out there. We can take that and asset deplete or asset qualify. It would more likely in this scenario be asset depletion. He's got a salary. He's making 15 grand a month, but he's a little over debt ratio. You take that $700,000 and asset, uh, asset depleted over 120 months and bang, we have the debt, debt ratio solved. So uh, we can use that in combination with this job as well. It doesn't have to be in a retirement account. Our minimum amount uh, in assets would be $500,000. But if you had uh, $500,000 in that asset account, you could deplete it and, and supplement his regular W-2 income with that. Now, and now let me give you a blow away comment regarding asset depletion will allow for cash out <laughs> on an asset depletion loan to be depleted. No one does that in the space. So. so Jonathan has been in the business for 27 years, but he's very excited, but he's brand new to bank statement loans and DSDR loans. So he's asking about training, marketing, support. How does he hit the ground running with these programs? We have marketing resources available that we can send um, to the brokers where they can send our flyers out that describe the programs, put their information on it to their contacts. Mm -hmm. And I believe we do have training classes regularly, different webinars. For or your account executive, reach out to your account executive, they'll walk you through that as well. Exactly, more importantly at Lenshore, we spend a lot of time training our salespeople in underwriting. We want our salespeople to know loans. We think they're much more effective when dealing with brokers. We think that brokers see them as a value add. And that's why I spent a fair amount of time teaching and training AEs in loans. So I would say call in, we'll, link it to an account executive and that account executive will help walk you through what we do. Okay, uh, Paula wants to know, uh, what's the minimum FICO score for bank statement program and along with the LTV? Well, 640 is the minimum uh, requirement for bank statement program. And I think that goes to 70 LTV and we do go all up to 90. I think we have a slide for that, don't we Rose? What, did we miss that one? Or? Uh, we might have missed that one. No, it was there. It was there. We, we oh, go no. LTV, we max. LTV max on a bank statement loan is 90%. There are a few, I'm not sure if anybody that I know of uh, that do it above 80. I think we're kind of uh, all on our own with that. Um, you know, w w we think we're really good lenders and we think when a loan makes sense, we should close it. So we will go to 90. We, I, I don't want to over advertise that saying we do tons of 85s and 90s because we don't, um, but we do them uh, 85s and 90s. And occasionally we'll make exceptions on the on the low side of 
the, the FICO range. Uh, so we have 640. Um, frankly, I tell you though, you know, when you're looking at someone's credit, we do look at credit in, in context with the bank statements themselves and say, well, how comes this guy's having a difficult time making his payments if he, if he makes all of this money that you're trying to argue? <laughs> you know, we definitely want to, we want two plus two to equal four when we go through that process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's that's part of evaluating bank statement income as well. I mean, if the guy doesn't have any assets and your SEQ is telling you he makes forty thousand dollars a month, you're like, okay, well, what am I missing here? There's 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 nothing in his savings account. So yeah, it, it's common sense. Okay. Joe, do you want to talk about Spark? Sparky. Sure, Spark is our um, PPE. It's our product and pricing engine. We have not promoted this heavily at this stage in the game, though in about 30 days we will. But it's available to you, um, and it just gives you the an ability to um, get pricing on an OnQM loan 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It basically asks for information. Um, kind of, you can use it at two different levels. You can put a minimum amount of information and get, uh, you know, an answer, or you can put a little more information in and you get a little more robust answer. Um, it does give you a different pricing options. It's set up in a way that says, well, okay, here's what we think is the best lowest payment option, and here's what the lowest rate option is. So you can look at it two different ways. Um, I think what what's important to understand when you use Spark is to understand we keep on saying that we're make sense lenders. What does that mean really? Well, I can explain it to you this way. 35% of the loans that we do have exceptions on them. So when we go do a securitization and we do them every quarter at, the, at a minimum, sometimes every other month, um, when we do that, we have to say in the the prospectus, how many of these loans have exceptions? And, and I, so I know that we're doing between 32 and 40% exceptions. So obviously when you put a loan into a product and pricing engine, it's a very in the box kind of approach to pricing a loan, right? So what I'd urge you to, to say, to look at is, is if Spark says no, and you still think it's a good loan, and you said, well, I'd lend my own money, uh, then you shouldn't be talking to your AE and saying, hey, uh, can we talk through this? We put it through Spark, um, and Spark said no, um, but I think it's a good loan for the following reasons. You should have that dialogue, and you're going to talk to an AE who knows their way around loans, and uh, obviously what Kelly described, send us a 1003 credit and bank statements, and you know our front-end pre-qual process, we do that on all of our loans, our front-end pre-qual process, you know, within 24 to 48 hours, we're giving you a very, very powerful approval. Um, and I would tell you that 90% of the time when that loan ultimately gets submitted, we approve it the way it was originally approved in the pre-qual stage. It's something that we do that is unique. Um, it does take a, a, a day or two, sometimes three. It really depends on how quickly you can get some of the questions answered. But the way we look at that process is, we hate 11th hour changes. We, we, we never want to go to a broker with an 11th hour change. So we don't want to put ourselves in that spot because we know that from a broker's point of view, man, you think you've got X and now you're two days before closing on a purchase transaction and there's two or three houses involved in this transaction. So when you, when you blow this thing up, you're going to be affecting a lot of relationships, that's very ugly. So we look at that and we say, we don't wanna be there. So we would rather talk to a broker upfront, spend a day or two or three. If, if we're conversing with one another, it can be done in 24 hours, sometimes within a few hours. It's really a function of how quickly the broker and uh, we get the answers to the questions that we have. Um, so that's, that's kind of our process that works in conjunction with Spark. Oh, I'm going to be promoting Spark uh, heavily here, probably in 60 days, uh, but it works now. We've had it in place for a year or two. Um, we're making some changes on the in internal side of things um, that 
kind of go hand in hand with Spark, and that's why I've held off on promoting it. Um, but just keep on remembering that we're make sense lenders, um, but we make you know make smart loans. We don't we don't do stupid loans. I'm not I don't want to advertise to you that we will do every loan that you bring us because that that won't happen. Okay, but I can tell you if you bring us good loans that make sense and maybe a little out of the guidelines this way or that way, um, highly likely that we're going to try to find a way to get get that done. Private label marketing resources. So as Kelly mentioned earlier, there we do have a collection of uh, flyers, postcards, even videos and banners that you can take, you can download, you can add your logo, you can add your disclaimers, you can add your contact info so that you can start reaching out to your referral partners right away and get started with these programs. We have a bunch definitely on bank statement programs um, that you can use immediately. So take a look for an email from me in about an hour um, that I will include a copy of the slide deck, I will include a recording of this webinar, and I'm going to include a link to so that you can download the flyers that are located on um, the private label resource kit. So Q&A. Um, Michael, yes, I'm going to have a AE reach out to you. I'll, I will make a note of that. And everybody else, if you know, um, I'm going to have I'm going to ask our AEs to contact each of you just to make sure that you don't have any questions and if you need anything. But if you don't want to wait, um, when you get that email in about an hour, go ahead and reply. To, that's going to come to, directly to me. And I promise you, I will drop everything that I'm doing and I will get on the phone and I will get an AE to contact you immediately. So, uh, Fanny and Freddie just, uh, let's see, Linda wants to know, Fanny and Freddie just changed their seasoning requirements to one year for cash out refis. Uh, what is the requirement for second home cash out uh, owned under a year? Um, I'll answer it since Kelly doesn't want to answer it. But uh, So, <laughs> look, we have the same one-year seasoning requirement. But I think I've said enough times that we make sense lenders and we make exceptions to the rule every day. So there's plenty of occasions in which we make exceptions to our one-year seasoning. Okay. Um, I would say, though, I'm not uber aggressive doing crazy things on cash out transactions. So, for example, the guy comes to me and he says, I bought this house for $190,000 13 months ago, which means that it's, you know, outs it, it, it's not a seasoning issue. And now this home's worth $500,000. The underwriter in me is gonna say, what did you do to this property to make it go from 190 to 500? So we ask those kinds of questions because we want things to logically make sense. And remember this, I've been given the authority to do any loan that I wanna do by Ellington. And Ellington securitizes all of our all of the loans that we do. We sell to six different other investors as well, but. Ellington gets a lot of them, and then they securitize them. And our loans outperform everybody else, else's in the space. What I would say to you is, and I say this to my investors all the time, the people who buy our loans, I say, look, the last thing that I want to do is pee on your leg. And peeing on their leg means giving them bad loans that don't perform. Because when that happens, the system gets broken. When you're trying to push loans down on someone that are going to break, not going to perform, ultimately the investor goes away. And then ultimately it's not good for my business. My business goes away. You've seen that here in the last six months, we had half a dozen companies in this space fail. And that's because they didn't have good relationship with good investors that work with them to hold them through, hold, work together to, to get through the difficult periods of time. I want my investors to be alongside me. Um, now they have such confidence in us that they deliver that authority. So you guys do whatever loans you want to do. Just make sure they got to perform. So that's the that's kind of the theme that we work with. Hope that answers your question. Okay. Jeff wants to know, we would love to see a training webinar on your bridge loans. Love uh, love you're in California and Missouri needed um, in that market. Now, Jeff, if you go to lencher.com under broker resources, you're going to see a category for webinars, uh, mortgage professional webinars. 
I think it was last month or the month before we did do one on, on bridge loans. So you'll be able to find them on bridge loans and a number of different topics. And those webinars are on demand. So again, that's on lencher.com, click on broker resources and then scroll down to mortgage professional webinars. Are we seeing a lot of condo tail loans in uh, Hawaii? Jeff wants to know. Um, particularly in Maui. What about DSCR loans in Ma in Hawaii? Yes, we do both of them. Um, parts of Maui uh, don't allow for condo tell, so you got to look at deed restrictions closely on those. Um, but we do loans on the Big Island and in, on Oahu. Uh, back just yesterday, I approved a DSCR and a condo tell. Uh, in Hawaii, so yes, uh, yes, we do them in Hawaii. However, you got to be paying attention to, you know, it's really you asked another question that I was kind of answering the short-term rental question. I would that's sorry, I kind of answered that question. Uh, some areas of Maui won't allow for the short-term rental income, so you got you got to be careful there. Um, so we uh, we'll ask that question when looking at condo hotels. Okay, uh, Luis wants to know, do you require proof for expenses mentioned in the SE, SEQ? No. No, we don't. Like, like I said, we, te we test it for reasonableness and we look at your bank statement. I mean, like I said, it, if it's quite disparate from what we see on the bank statement, we're gonna go back and say, hold it. We see $50,000 in salaries, you put 6,000. Obviously we'll notice that, but we don't ask for receipts. Uh, we may ask you to source a deposit. If there's a large deposit on occasion, we have asked for a sourcing of that deposit to make sure it was a, a you know, a re an invoice related transaction, an income related transaction, but we don't ask for receipts. No. Yeah, one person asked earlier if we automatically dump all large deposits or inordinate deposits that don't marry up with what you see mostly in the bank statement spread. The answer is no, we never really say no to, uh, you know, a column of deposits, but we will ask questions. And again, do that make sense? And uh, so that's what Steve was just saying. We, that happens frequently, but we don't arbitrarily, oh, these deposits are, you know, four, 13,000 and 14,000, and most of their deposits are, you know, 49 cents or $52 and you know it looks like a small retail store and then therefore we're not gonna use it. We say, well, talk to us about what they are <laughs> and then maybe we will use it. We wanna make loans. Okay. Uh, do you send out daily reach rate sheets? We do. Um, what we're using right now is Salesforce for the account executive, so your account rep should be able to send you and set up where you get the rate sheets delivered to you weekly if that's what you want i would well, we, don't, we don't change rates daily <laughs> that's not something that generally happens you know there have been times when we've had many rate changes because of the the dynamics in the market recently <laughs> have been a little bit wild but more often than not we may send out one we may change rates once maybe twice during a month uh, but it, it more often than not, you'll see a, a rate sheet last for an entire month. So it, it just depends on the, but, but we don't change rates daily. If that's uh, part of that question. Rafaela wants to know, what's the credit score for 12 months uh, bank statement loan? What LTV are you working with? So we go down to 660 up to, I believe, 80 per, or 75% but we need a 680 credit score for 12 months bank statements to 80%. Rafaela says uh, 90%. 90%, it's 24 months bank statements. We don't have a 12 month bank statement program and we require a 740 credit score. Okay. Um, so, sorry guys. On the bridge loan, uh, does the one, payment not due for a year still figure out in the DTI? No, no we don't consider. The only thing we consider for the bridged property in the debt ratio is an HOA if there is one. But the taxes, are there is no payment due and the taxes are prepaid for a year. So other other than that, there are no expenses tied to that bridged property. That's, that's how we help them qualify. 
that's part of the uniqueness of, of the product. That's what, that's what makes it beautiful is because yes. folks, see, there is another product in the market. I won't tell you the competitor's name, but they have a bridge loan. And what the way they approach it is they just say, okay, we'll allow the D it's going to be an amortized loan. And we're going to allow the DTI to go to 60. Well, borrowers generally don't want to have a DTI of 60% because they got to make the payments. So they'll say, no, no, I'm not comfortable with such a bridge loan. So most like our bridge loan a lot for that reason. Uh, Bedela wants to know, do you have a preliminary list of documents needed for your loans? If not, is that something you can create to make pre-qualification turnarounds as fast as possible? I would, we don't have a list that is ready to be emailed, but I would contact your account executive and they can tell you the documents that are needed based on the loan that you're trying to get qualified because the documents are going to change depending upon whether or not it's a DSTR versus bank statement or um, a second home or asset depletion. So there's not a generalized list um, because we base it on the loan. Let me answer, add to that, okay? So very often we're doing business with a paper brokers, okay? Um, we have great relationships with all of the largest mortgage banking companies in America. Guaranteed Rate, Fairway, Guild, all of them are on our list. We, we're approved with them. And they're very used to, you know, doing conventional loans. And they're very used to using, you know, Fannie Mae's DU and LP. So, you know, very often that a paper broker has a full package and they can deliver a TIFF file to you with 50 documents in it. Well, you can easily send that to us in an encrypted fashion and we'll go and pluck through it and take what we need to do your prequel. That's not unusual. Uh, obviously, the more information we have up front, the better answer we're going to give you and the faster we're going to get it to you. So, you know, a lot of people, when we have the underwriters that are on the front end of our process, they're not called underwriters, they're called credit analysts. Okay? They're taught just like, as I would teach an underwriter, they're taught to be an underwriter, but we don't call them underwriters because they help you structure deals. So those people, they could actually look at full doc income. They could be seeing it and say, oh my God, this full doc income is not going to work. And in a lot of shops, it's kiss of death. <sighs> Blow the loan up because we saw a full doc income. Not here. If it's in the front end with a credit analyst, we can look at full doc and say, okay, we'll have an opinion. Sometimes that helps us with the expense ratio. But you know, if we're going to go asset depletion loan and say, okay, we're going to go in this direction. So you know, we're make sense lenders. We don't want to book bad loans. We want to make loans that make sense. I've got a couple of people asking about the DSCR and the, the DACR ratio. Can we go below a one on a DSCR? We can. It's a FICO driven product. Um, we can go down to a 0.75, but there will be additional rate increase. But we do have flexibility for that at 70% LTV or below. Can we do a bridge loan and then have the borrower do the purchase as an agency loan with another lender? I'm told that the answer is no, but I'm told that the agencies won't allow it. So very often we will do the loan, that second loan as well, and it parks itself with us for seven to eight months because we have an EPO policy that you guys don't want to get hit. And we never, ever, ever want to call a broker up and ask them for the premium back. That's a very ugly place to be. We don't want to do that. So we talk about EPO up front. We're not afraid to have that conversation. And we basically say, look, we want to stay in the books for eight months and you can refi that. Okay. What about the cannabis business? Uh, Ricardo wants to know, do we do bank statement loans for the cannabis business? The quick answer is no smoking fatties at Lenshore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ricardo. <laughs> uh, Tamara wants to know, can we do VA loan with the Lenshaw Bridge loan? No. 
we, we have to have the purchase loan as well. That's why we're doing the bridge loan to facilitate that purchase. Yes. What's the best way to send documentation in an encrypted way? The account executive who you are signed up with should have a link to the um, their secured site, or you can send it through your company's encryption and then just give us access to be able to um, log in to your where your um, site is. Looking for creative ways to compete with local banks and condo tells. They're almost selling rates in the fives. Any comment on that? God bless them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're not doing them in the fives. I know there's, a, there's always, that phenomenon kind of always exists. Uh, you know, we, we're not going to serve every loan and every bar, borrower, every broker. We're not going to be able to do that. We know that. Um, there's plenty of things that we do that they don't do. I promise you that. Um, for example, we, we do have DSCR connected to Cond Hotels. We allow for that. I'm sure your local bank doesn't. We do allow for short-term rental. Many people won't. Uh, those are just two examples of what we can do associated with Cond con Hotels that others don't. But we're not going to be we're not going to be the end all. We, so, we, I don't think candidly, I don't think we want a portfolio full of just uh, Cond Hotels. So I mean, <laughs> that's part of that. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to um, say thank you to everybody who joined us today in our webinar. If you have any other questions, please feel free to, uh, again, reach out to your Lenture account executive or reply to the email that you're going to get from me in about an hour, and I'll get that answered to you um, as soon as possible. I'd like to thank our speakers today. Thank you, Steve and Kelly and Joe, for joining us today. Any last thank words, Joe? Yeah, bro, we bro, were, were all of the questions answered? I don't want <laughs> I think so. I think we answered, um, let's see, we're, we talked about different types of incomes working together. Okay. Uh, I talked about the videos that are going to be in the private label. So I think that was it. Okay. okay. Um, I would just, uh, yeah, I would just thank you for taking the time to spend with us today. Um, as I said, we, we make money when we close loans. That's exactly when you make money. So we will work together to try to close loans. So look forward to doing business with you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.